basically in medical school, you're 100% a medical student. And what I realized is I basically had to give up a balanced life. Any sports, any extracurricular activities uh, were just gone. It was medical school and coming home to sleep. So when I finished medical school, I began my residency at LA County Hospital. And from the very beginning, I was working 110 hours a week. I was staying at the hospital for up to 36 hours at a time. It was all consuming. So now I've been through four years of pre-medical school, four years of medical school, and four years of residency. And I was looking forward to beginning my medical practice where things would settle down a little bit. Little did I realize that starting a new medical practice, my responsibilities would increase even more. I carried into the medical practice uh, this sleep deficit and emotional deficit, um, physical deficit, from my 12 years of intense uh, schooling. And as a obstetrician, I was required to be on call 24 hours a day and seven days a week. My first year in practice, I was delivering an average of 30 babies a month. Um, and as you can imagine, half of those babies are born in the middle of the night. So literally, uh, there were many weeks when I would work during the day and I'd work during the night. The concept of any kind of balance to my life, you know, I didn't even have any time to think about. My wife and I have uh, got to know Dr. Rick pretty well over the past three years. He's an incredible doctor. Many of you guys know this. He's a good dude, too. <laughs> However, trying to get pregnant without any positive results does something to you. Dr. Rick talked with us. He walked with us. And he even prayed with us on several occasions. Yet month after month after month after a long month, we were forced to face a very difficult reality. Fortunately, we didn't have to walk this journey alone, though. So many friends and family members and shoreliners instilled hope in us. They prayed for us, and they continue to pray. They prayed diligently. Many of you in here, you prayed fervently. And now, as many of you know, all that praying worked. Because seven weeks ago, my wife, Katie, gave birth to our son, Kingston Edward Tibbs. Yeah. <laughs> I like to say that you guys prayed us pregnant. It's a phrase that's new to me, and I kind of like it. And I'll give you one guess as to who our doctor was. Dr. Rick Alexander, that's right. You go to Chomp, you mention his name, or you walk the halls with him, he's like a celebrity over there. It's like walking the halls with Brad Pitt or LeBron or someone, you know? <laughs> But all that comes at a price. You heard it on the video. He said that he had no balance to his life. He was working 110 hours a week and delivering, on average, 30 babies a month. That's crazy. 30 babies. He said the sleep deprivation left him emotionally, mentally, physically just spent. He was exhausted. However, if you spend 30 seconds with Rick today you realize that he has somehow grasped the secret to a balanced life. He's different. He understands the power of what I believe God has ordained me to share with you this morning. So some of you guys might be wondering, hey, where's Pastor Kevin? Why am I up here instead of him? Well, two weeks ago, Pastor Kevin pulled me in his office and he said, hey, Nate, got something for you, man. I'm going to be out of town. I'll be back in town to preach on Sunday morning, but just in case, I need you to get ready. I need you to pray. I need you to start prepping. I need you to, to get ready just in case I can't make it. And I say in quotes, he told me this, that there was only a 1% chance that he wouldn't make it back to preach on Sunday morning. One percent chance. Well, his flight got canceled. I got a call last night, and here I am this morning. 
And I believe, yeah. <laughs> I believe, I know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm supposed to bring a word of the Lord to you this morning. God has planned it all along. He had a plan. Kevin didn't. Kind of he did, because that's just Kevin. <laughs> I didn't. But God ordained it. I do believe that. God has ordained this. So I'm not just going to bring a word of the Lord, but God has spoken to me in my heart, and he's challenged me. I want to bring a word from the Lord as well, because I believe, I really do believe that, the, that God has a word for you as well. And so you ready to dig in? Yes. Let's do it. Let's pray. God, I ask that you would open our ears to hear exactly what it is that you want us to hear. God, that you would give us minds to understand and comprehend your word, your voice. May we hear it. God, give us eyes to see what it is that you want us to see. And may we embrace this concept of being empowered by your Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for every single person in this room, both believer and seeker and non. It doesn't matter, God. You have drawn them here for a very specific reason. Now speak in only the way that you can speak. Empower us to hear, to be motivated, to be the people that you've called us to be. I pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You and I were not called to be powerful in and of ourselves. We're not to do things on our own strength all the time. We're not called to do that. We're also not called to be powerless victims either. We're not. We're called to find that happy medium, to be empowered. We have an opportunity to be empowered by the presence of Jesus every moment of every day. That's what we've been looking at. But do you really believe that? I know a lot of you do that we can be empowered by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit every moment of every day. And we talked in week one how God does this. In week one, we talked about how he empowers us through suffering, pain, and loss. God empowers us in a way that only he can through his Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Spirit through these times when we are facing loss and pain, where we are suffering, where you don't want to get out of bed. God gave you his strength. You know this that allowed you to just get up, to walk in a time where you didn't have that strength. How does he do that? It's the Holy Spirit, because he loves you. In week two, we talked about how he empowers us through community, how in community, when God empowers you, you're able to experience and do things you can't do on your own. We are wired for community, to do life with people intentionally in a way that honors God. He empowers us to do that. This morning, I believe that we're supposed to talk about being empowered by rest and Sabbath. Rest and Sabbath. It's kind of ironic given the fact that I have a seven-week-year-old. What is rest? <laughs> I know two hours here, change a diaper, wipe, nurse, go back to bed, hour and a half later, get up. I got four hours last night. I'm feeling good. <laughs> we can be empowered by rest, and it comes in the form of a Sabbath. But you know this. I don't need to say it, but I'm going to say it anyways. We live in a busy world. We are on mock speed. We have a thousand things to do every single week. We're plugged in. We're connected. We're doing one thing, but we're thinking about the next 15 things throughout the rest of the day. And it's just tough. It's tough to hear this word that we're called to a Sabbath. We're commanded to do a Sabbath and to just rest Nate, you're telling me that I can just rest? Yeah, it's not easy, but we are called to do it. I, I wonder if you'll resonate with, uh, with this video that I want to show you. This is a snapshot, just a glimpse into the day of the life of John Ryan, Bethany, and their adorable son, Jack. This is great. Check it out. Jack in the car. Man, my top 
not so much. That's because we don't visit them enough. There's not enough time. So you want to have another one? Oh. <laughs> yes. Isn't he cute? Spaghetti and all. So that's what I got to look forward to, huh? All right, bring it on. I want to share two lessons from the Bible that I'm convinced still speak to us today. The first lesson is this, is from ancient Israel. It's called manna and maggots. Manna and maggots takes us to Exodus 16. Uh, Let me set the table, though, real quick. We're seeing here that what's going on is the people of Israel are in the desert. They're wandering in the desert, and they're hungry. They're really hungry. Some might even say they're hangry. You know what that is, right? When you're angry because you're hungry, because you're angry, they're hangry. Not the kind of hunger that a Snickers bar can, uh, can satisfy either. <laughs> they probably have the kind of hunger where they feel like they're going to die because they're hungry, because they haven't eaten. Like death is knocking at the door. And they found themselves wandering in the desert with very scarcity of food options. But this is just on the heels of a momentous moment that they got to experience, that they were a part of. They had just been a part of a miraculous, a miracle that is one for the ages. They were part of the parting of the Red Sea. They crossed through, literally through the Red Sea. And they escaped Pharaoh in 400 years of slavery. They saw God's hand deliver them. Things were great at that moment. Things were really great. But they do what only the Israelites can do best, and they grumbled, and they complained. And all of a sudden, they found themselves wandering in the desert. And it was only by God's grace and mercy that he provided for them yet again, just like God does for you and me every time we mess up. Manna in the morning and meat at night is how God provided for them in this moment. Moses gave the people of Israel very simple instructions. Moses said, gather, eat, don't save for tomorrow. We pick it up in verse 17. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much. And the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone had gathered just as much as they needed. Then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until morning. Simple instructions, right? One, gather. Two, eat. Three, don't save for tomorrow. This isn't rocket surgery. This isn't a 12-step program, right? Three steps. Verse 20 says this. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning but it was full of maggots and began to smell. You ever driven by roadkill that's been there for way too long? And you, and you, and you, you look, but you don't want to look, but then you find yourself looking like, oh, geez, look at that. All bloated. Sometimes you can see maggots. Not a pretty sight. That's kind of what's going on here in the house of the Israelites, the rebellious ones who didn't do what Moses commanded them to do. And those commands came from God himself to Moses, which he then passed They had a lack of faith. They didn't believe that there was going to be manna for the next morning, so they kept some for themselves. And you know they were the talk of the town. You know if you were there, and you heard about this thing that happened with maybe your friends. They kept some over the night, and now they got maggots all up in their house. You know they were talking about it like, dude, did you hear about this? Dude, it stinks over at their house. Do not, whatever you do, do not keep maggots overnight. Like, I know Moses told us, but Moses tells us a lot of things, but this one you need to listen to, right? Can you imagine? Gosh, what is that smell? That is disgusting. They were talk of the town. And then Moses had to give them another instruction because the Sabbath was coming up, and they're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And so Moses instructs them that they're supposed to get a double portion of manna to get ready for the Sabbath. And I want to read you an excerpt from Kevin's book because it really paints a picture of what it must have been like if you were there at that time when Moses says, hey, I know I told you not to save any, but this time you're actually going to save some overnight. Don't worry, trust God in this. You won't have maggots. By God's leading, Moses told the people they were not to go out and collect manna on the Sabbath day. This was a day of rest. This led to one new instruction. Collect double manna on day six and store it overnight so that they would have nourishment on the Sabbath. 
Picture these grumbling, whining, rebellious people opening their container of manna on the Sabbath day after it had sat overnight. Can you see them plugging their noses, averting their eyes, and not wanting to smell the stench or see the maggots crawling through their manna? Have you ever opened a mystery container that has been forgotten in the corner of the refrigerator for weeks or months? Yeah, I have. You know the feeling of being reluctant to look at the science experiment that has been grown in your refrigerator. If you've had that experience, you have a sense of what they must have felt as they opened their manna container the next morning. And to their shock, the manna was fresh and sweet. No heinous smell, no crawling bugs, just heavenly breakfast. Verse 24. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it. But on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will, be, there will not be any. This is a culinary miracle that just happened. Now, what is God trying to teach the people of Israel? And what is he trying to teach you and me today in regards to this? If you're a note taker, write this in. God will provide in miraculous ways when we are faithful to follow his wise plan of Sabbath. He did then, and he will continue to do it today because God is not changing. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. When we are faithful, he will provide. So what is at the heart of Sabbath? I really believe that some of us in this room we don't practice the Sabbath or we're not in a good rhythm of Sabbath because what is a Sabbath anyways? It just sounds dated. It sounds like it's just something for them. It's not. We're missing out if you're not experiencing a Sabbath of a rest for your soul. The heart of Sabbath is this idea of a rhythm of one in seven. That you rest one day out of seven. One day out of the week that you're just resting. And it should be a full day, if possible. A full day. Some of you guys, your Sabbath is Sunday. That's why you're here. You're drinking in what God has for you, and you're going to rest later this, this afternoon. That's great. Some of us don't have the luxury of spending a full day. Maybe you can do what ancient Israel did. They didn't just spend a whole Sunday. Their Sundays wasn't Sabbath. Their Sabbath was sundown on Friday till sundown on Saturday night. If that's what you need to do, do that. Try to find a 24-hour period where you can just rest and cease from work. That's another thing that we need to do if we're going to exercise a biblical Sabbath that we cease from work and embrace rest. Embrace rest. Some of you need to take a nap. Take three naps. Can you do that? Yeah, it's your Sabbath. Some of you need to go play golf. You rest and you relax when you play golf. Some of you better not play golf <laughs> on your Sabbath because it is not restful. Come back with less clubs than when you left the home with, right? And a potty mouth. Some of you guys need to work out. That, that's restful. Do Pilates. Play video games. I don't know. You know. I'm not going to tell you how you do your Sabbath other than the fact that what the Bible says is supposed to be a full day. And we're supposed to cease from work. We're supposed to rest. Embrace rest. And we're supposed to disconnect too. This is something I think this is why this is so hard for us and why we don't experience a heavenly rest. Because we are so connected. We're so connected to our phones, tethered to our laptops, our iPads, whatever it is, and it's almost impossible for us to truly disconnect. And some of you guys, I understand it. Like, you need to stay connected to some degree. But what I'm saying here is disconnect from your social medias. Disconnect from all of that that distracts you from the last point, and that's connecting. From connecting to your heavenly Father who wants to give you rest for your soul. From connecting to your wife, to your husband. From connecting to your family members who've been waiting to hear from you. Or a friend or a roommate or a colleague, you know God's placed their name, their face in your mind, and you just are supposed to chat with them, grab coffee, disconnect but connect into the one who can truly give your soul rest. So I wonder what we would hear if the people of Israel who were wandering the desert at that time, struggling to find rest, what they would say to you and me who are wandering through our days, struggling to find rest. If they could speak to us today, it would probably sound a little bit like this. Dear brothers and sisters, don't fight God's wisdom. He made the universe and he created you. He really does know best. When he calls us to work and gather only six days and rest one day a week, he means it. 
don't choose to resist God and learn the hard way, unless you really like bad smells and maggots. <laughs> Accept God's gracious gift of rest. Trust his ability to provide for you in only six days of work, labor, and gathering. Believe that God delights to provide you what you need, as only a loving father can. Then, take a day to cease from your work, find rest in God, be with people you love, worship the one who loves you, and drink in his refreshment. God is on the throne, and he can provide everything you need and more. Declare your trust and faith in him by learning to rest and Sabbath well. When you do, you will open your jar of manna after it is sat overnight and discover it is fresh, sweet, and there is enough to fill you to overflowing. Hmm. The powerful, they do the things they want to do it. Don't try to tell them otherwise. And they'll gather manna seven days a week because that's what it takes to be successful. However, God says, you don't need to work seven days. I want you to rest. You will be more productive, more efficient if you're working those six days out of a restful spirit. The powerless says, I have no problem resting. In fact, they don't want to get up to gather their own manna. They want other people to do it for them. And the empowered, they understand that God is our Jehovah Jireh. He's our divine and eternal provider. They love to work hard, but they also love the freedom that comes from relaxing, from resting, from experiencing the Sabbath. Embrace that. And the second lesson is from Elijah. I like to call this one a nap and a snack. Elijah, 1 Kings 19, 4 through 8 is where we're going to go here. But let me, uh, again, let me set the table what's going on with the context here. Just one chapter before this, Elijah is a part of a miraculous event, another miracle, powerful one too. Elijah is at Mount Carmel, and there's a showdown at Mount Carmel. Some of you guys are familiar with this story, aren't you? It's 450 verses 1. 450 prophets of Baal trying to prove that their God is the one true God. And one prophet, Elijah himself, rolling solo, saying, I'm going to prove that my God is the one true God. Here's what was going on. There was a, there was a drought going on. Three years, there was a drought. And we find that they're going to set up an altar. They're going to sacrifice a bull, put it on the altar, but they're not going to set fire to it because the way that we're going to figure out who is the true God is we're going to pray to our God. You pray to yours, he's going to pray to his. Whoever's God brings fire down to consume the altar and the sacrifice, that's the true God. Stage is set. Elijah says, you guys go first. There's more of you. They start praying. They start calling out to their false god, Baal. They start going crazy. It says they're dancing. They're going all, they start in the morning and around noontime, the word says Elijah starts to taunt them. I like this guy. It actually says that. It's not going to be up on the screens, but just listen. Try to picture this. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. I mean, surely he's a God, that God of yours, right? Perhaps he's deep in thought though, or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. Verse 28 says, so they shouted louder. (laughs) <laughs> well, maybe Elijah's right. Dang it. And they slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. It takes on a serious tone. This is sad. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. One of the most sad and depressing verses right there for these people. There was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. They're bleeding. They're they're mutilating themselves because they're that that desperate for a God who will listen to them, who will provide for them, who will show that he is real. And they're reaching out for the wrong thing. Elijah finally says, enough. You guys have been searching too long. Let me show you the one true God. And he fixes the altar, sacrifices the bull, puts it on there. And then he says, to prove my point, that my God is real, that he is, in, he is powerful, he's able to do more than we can ask or imagine, immeasurably more. He says, pour four large buckets of water on that altar. The guy's like, what are you talking about? He's like, do it. In fact, why don't you do it a second time and do it a third time? This is precious commodity water. It's been a drought for three years. Now the altar is just seeping with water. It says that there's a trough around it that is just full of water. And Elijah prays. 
and ask Yahweh, the one true God, to prove to these people that he is God. And only he is God. And he has power to do anything. Immediately, fire rains down from heaven. And not only consumes the sacrifice and the altar, but it says that the fire licked up the water. And they fell prostrate, it says, saying, Elijah's God is the true God. Elijah's God is the true God. Powerful story. Miraculous event. That's what's going on in the life of Elijah right now. Now we jump to chapter 19. Look what happens in verse 4 here. Elijah, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under a bush and fell asleep. He's depressed. He's scared. He's lonely. He's at his wits, and he is absolutely exhausted. People are coming after him because of what happened the time before, and he feels alone. Even though he experienced God in a miraculous way just, just minutes prior, he says, I'm done, God. I have nothing left. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. Can you imagine that? You are spent. You have nothing left. You pass out. You think you're done. You even tell God to take your life. And you feel a touch from an angel. And there's heavenly bread, freshly baked and water. He eats it, falls back asleep because he's that exhausted. He's in that much need of rest. And not just a nap, but like divine rest. The rest that gives rest to your soul to strengthen your bones. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up. For the journey is too much for you. The journey is too much for you in your own strength. So he got up, ate, and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. Strengthened by that food. Strengthened by that rest. He was able to do what he could not do and travel. 40 days and 40 nights to be exact. And this, this is powerful for you and me if we can grasp this. Have you ever seen a baby sleep, an infant sleep, how peaceful they are? I mean, when they're like really sacked out. I told you my son is seven weeks old. Here's a picture of him at day two. <laughs> Look at that guy. Look at those cheeks. Day two, he stole our heart. Day one, actually. But this is a picture. Was taken. How peaceful is that? Wouldn't it be amazing if you could sleep like that, not a care in the world? Like that you could just grab some goldfish crackers and your binky, you know, and just snuggle up. You believe that you can have that kind of rest? And not just a nap. I'm not just talking about a nap. I'm talking about like rest for your soul, the kind of rest that only a divine being can give you, Yahweh can give you. Here's a picture of when he wakes up and he starts to stretch. It's too cute. It's just too cute. <laughs> Come on. I got a mic so I can do this. This is fun. And this is what he looks like a couple minutes later when he's thinking. <laughs> he's got mom's eyes. We call him buggy. Don't tell her I said that. <clears throat> he is so stinking cute. Let me read you the words from Psalms 127. And let this just nourish your soul. You guys really... If we're going to embrace a biblical Sabbath, we have to get this because you will continue to spin your wheels and just be exhausted until you get to the place where Elijah was and says, take my life. I'm done. I don't want you to get there. You don't have to get there. Don't get there. Hear this. Psalms 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. And so if you're taking notes, write this. Sometimes what, God, sometimes what God's kids need is just a little rest and some nourishment. And so if Elijah were here today and he could speak to you and me who feel exhausted, spent, maybe in some of you that are like, I'm done. God, I am done unless you do something here. I want you to hear the words 
from Elijah. Kevin wrote these words, but it's in the heart and the personality of Elijah. Check it out. Weary one, you have run hard, worked diligently, and served faithfully. You have pressed on and followed God through battles and the furnace of this life. Now you are tired. You are weary. You are poured out and empty. Just stop. Stop working. Stop striving. Stop pushing and stop driving forward. It's time to rest. Open your heart to receive the grace of God and the filling of his spirit. Open your mouth and eat warm bread and drink cool, fresh water. Take a nap. Put your frazzled and weary mind to bed. Drink in the refreshment of God. There will be another day to labor for the Lord. He will infuse you and use you again. But today, rest. Have a snack. Take a nap. Fall exhausted in the arms of God and let him hold you and speak words of comfort, hope, and grace. Hmm. Now hear the words of Jesus spoken to believers, to non-believers of that day, but spoken really to you and me. We need to hear this. This is powerful. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. These are the words of Jesus, who was a rabbi. A rabbi in that day was a teacher. And if you wanted to be like a rabbi, if you wanted to become a rabbi, you had to learn from a rabbi. In order to learn from a rabbi, you had to take on his yoke. His yoke was his teaching, his way of life, his philosophy. You could not become a rabbi unless you took on the yoke of rabbi. And you could only become a rabbi if you were the best of the best, the elitist. You had to take on their yoke. Jesus says, you don't have to be elitist. You just have to come because my yoke is easy and my burden is light and I'm gentle and humble in heart. Everybody has an opportunity to take on the yoke of Jesus. And he says it's easy and the burden is light. Jesus invites us all to take his yoke on ourselves, to follow his ways. And let me close with this last note. Your good shepherd invites you to rest. Your good shepherd invites you to rest, true rest, divine rest, because we all need it. Psalms 23 is what I want to close with, and I would ask that as I close, you would close your eyes and you would just hear this. This is divinely inspired words by the Holy Spirit. It's a Psalm of David. He penned it, but the Holy Spirit had him write it, inspired it. I pray that it would nourish your soul. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, I pray that you would give us the courage to disconnect, to unplug, and to connect into you in a way that maybe we've never done before or that we used to, and we need to come back home. Allow us to experience a Sabbath rest where we just dig into the presence of you, Jesus. Would your Holy Spirit fill us, anoint us, like it says our, anoint is, our head is anointed with this oil. Would you just let it run over with your goodness, with your grace? God, I ask for your presence to be thick in the hearts of your people here this morning, and they would respond to you. They would run to you. God, I know that we all in this room want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May it be so as we seek you. And may your words come true that when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. Oh, Jesus, draw near to us right now. We pray this in the matchless and powerful name of Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Amen, Amen, you guys. Hey, a couple announcements just real quick, and then I'll let you go to enjoy this beautiful, uh, beautiful day we got. Uh, Shoreline membership class is next Sunday. If you're interested in becoming a member or just have questions about what is Shoreline, what do you believe, meet some staff, all that, we're going to serve lunch, and it's going to happen from 1 to 2.30 next Sunday in the Parkside Room. Speaking of lunch, the uh, military uh, ministry does a quarterly luncheon for all our military folks, which we absolutely love. And if you want to get connected with other military personnel and pastors here in the church, we want to feed you one just to say thank you for your service. You guys are awesome but also that we can connect and have community. That's happening today in the Parkside Room, and that's happening at 1245. It's just an hour long. Please check that out if you got that. Other than that, you guys are dismissed. Have a great day. May you rest in God's presence. Amen? Amen. Amen.